Welcome into the second episode of Commodore Clash. Today on the show, Jonah Barbin and Andrew Wilf break down Vanderbilt football's win over Alabama A&M. Talk about soccer. They haven't lost a game yet. Will they ever stop? And what will Vanderbilt do in a tough test against Wake Forest? All coming up on the show. Welcome into Commodore Clash. I am Jonah Barbin, joined by sports editor Andrew Wilf, as always. And we have some big topics for you today. A couple of Vanderbilt football things to discuss, as well as Vanderbilt soccer. So, Andrew, let's get right into it. Is there more to be encouraged or discouraged about these first two games for Vanderbilt football? Absolutely. I think encouragement. When you think about the record, it's 2-0, and and although you played Hawaii and Alabama A&M, which are both non-conference opponents that are supposed to be wins, it's still 2-0 and to a team and a franchise that's kind of been a losing team the past few seasons. I, when we think about how it breaks down, Vanderbilt's defense really didn't play great against Hawaii. There were a lot of lackluster plays. There were a lot of broken coverages, specifically in the secondary with B.J. Anderson and C.J. Taylor really missing assignments. And then we went to Alabama A&M. Remember, the, the spread was 35 points. Vanderbilt won by 34. But if you really look into it, but beyond the box score, it was concerning how slow of a start the first half was. But second half, I think Vanderbilt really got into the rhythm. I think it is encouragement just to see the way the, run, the rushing attack really improved, specifically with Cedric Alexander. But A.J. Swan's indecisiveness and Vanderbilt's secondary is definitely a cause for concern to an extent. But I would not put any warning signs yet. Man, let me tell you, I am discouraged. These first two games were absolute lobs, and I left both games feeling insecure about this team going forward. You talked about, and we talked about the kind of the concerns with why we didn't have a show last week, but pass defense, really poor, right? It was a good passing performance in the first game by A.J. Swan was finding the receivers. Jaden McGowan looked really good. So those were kind of the building blocks that I was looking for in the second game. I was a little concerned with the run game uh, in the first game, just about how Clark Lee is going to use these guys. How is Patrick Smith going to be used? How is Chase Gillespie going to be used? How is Cedric Alexander going to be used? And that is the one thing I got clarity on in the second game. I hope they keep going back to Cedric Alexander. He was averaging seven yards a carry in that game. Two touchdowns, 87 yards, only 20 12 carries. I mean, it was absolutely automatic. But yeah, I'm discouraged. What is a team center around? A quarterback and a defense. And I don't know if I believe in either of them right now. A.J. Swan was, he was bad in, in, against AM. He was. 51.72% of his passes completed. So nearly half of his passes were incomplete. A 36.67% success rate, which is an advanced metric, which dictates on first down how many yards you're supposed to get in, in certain down and distance situations. I got to be a little worried about the guy, right? I, I, I've been an A.J. Swan proponent since the beginning. He's Clark Lee's guy. I think he has very good talent, but I, I, I'm still not exactly seeing it. And that first half, I get it. I get it. Vanderbilt saved themselves in the second half, Andrew. But they, they weren't great. The defense improved. I think you were a lot more concerned on that first drive that, that took a lot of time off the clock, right? Ended up holding them to a field goal. Couldn't stop a and on third down to begin the game, 5-of-5. Five five. Eventually got that under control. And then that 62-yard touchdown to begin the half. Besides that, some improvements there, but I'm still concerned about the secondary. I think it's very hard to really judge the team so early in the season because what we've learned from Vanderbilt football is they play up for their competition, also down to their competition. Let's think about the NIU game last year. Obviously, there was no film on Swan, but he dished four touchdowns. First time ever of a first-year quarterback in their first game had four touchdowns. He is, I don't think he's a natural leader in that he's the most vocal person, but he's getting into that experience. And to do that, you have to have these type of moments of, okay, you don't have a great first half, but figure it out, win the game out. And then he played so, so well in the third quarter that they ended up being able to t put in Walter Taylor, Ken Seals, and, and Dickey. So, so that was really exciting. I think when I think about the secondary, talking about your issues, I think it's more of a scheme thing than the personnel. There were a lot of times where there were broken coverages, where two players didn't know where they were. And when, when that happens, that's more on the coaching staff. So I really hope and, and believe that Clark Lee and the defensive staff will be able to pick things up. Nick Howell is in his second year, and I wouldn't say he's on the hot seat quite yet, but he really needs to pick up his act before a Wake Forest game and really tough SEC competition. Yeah, we're going to get to that game in a little bit. That, that's going to be a tough one. But uh, before we move on, I just want to ask you, Cedric Alexander, 
Do you like carving a bigger role for him in the offense? Do you think he will rise to the top of this depth chart? Yeah, I, I asked this to Clark Lee after the game on Saturday, and I think Cedric had an amazing performance. He had two touchdowns in his first collegiate debut, but when we break it down, it's hard because Patrick Smith's also very solid, so is Chase Gillespie. Cedric was playing against very tired Alabama A&M defense, so it's hard to really judge it, but to see so much fire out of a true freshman, again, he's only 5'9", I think he needs to get a little bit bigger, but I think he should get more, uh, more carries because it's wasting talent. You, you see him on the, on the field, he had a great hurdle, he had, he had one play where he eluded six or seven defenders and ran for a touchdown. That's the type of physicality you need in SEC games. I will say this, if you're Clark Lee, you feel good about running any of the running backs right now, given that Patrick Smith and Chase Gillespie both average five yards a carry, respectively. Again, Cedric Alexander even a little bit better, and I think when we're talking about a higher ceiling, we can talk about Alexander. But let's move on now and get to our second topic. So through six games, Vanderbilt soccer is unbeaten, 3-0-3. What is the most exciting thing about this team right now? I think about freshman Ella Eggleston. She has come onto the scene and really dominated in, in, in every way. I'm really excited for our assistant sports specialist, Jace Pollard, to be doing a feature on her. She was vital in the tie against Northwestern. She scored a goal at the end of the game. To give everyone context, Vanderbilt lost to Northwestern in the NCAA tournament last year, and to beat the 24th ranked team, when a lot of people doubted Vanderbilt would even be able to compete, was so inspiring. And we've been talking about this for the past few months now. Head coach Darren Ambrose is so good at facilitating an amazing message to this whole team. And we think about Rachel Durescu, who has intense, really great leadership. And you're really seeing such great cohesion. And I really can't wait for SEC play to start because Vanderbilt will totally be able to complete, compete like if they have performances like the Northwestern game. I think they will be able to compete as well because, you, again, you talk about Ambrose, great team, start with great coaches. You've got a great coach there, right? Then you, you kept that core, as we talked about in the first episode of Commodore Clash, of, of people who can lead, players who know how to lead in that locker room, infused with a lot of young talent, as you were alluding to. And, and the game against Northwestern really tells me what kind of team we have on their hands because not only was it a game where they eliminated you last year, we're doubting what they're going to be this year. But they go down early, 3-1, right? Oh, yeah. and, and they come out of the locker room on a mission and are able to tie that game at three. I mean, that told me everything I needed to know about this team. And we also, Andrew, talked about kind of, you got to get shots on goal, right? If you're winning that game, eventually the law of averages will tell you that you'll probably start winning games because you're just getting more chances at the goal. They outshot Northwestern by nearly double, 13-7. Right? So we talked about that working against them in a game before where they, where they outshot a team and ended up drawing when they should have probably won. But 13-7 to against the number 24 team in the nation, pretty impressive. Absolutely, and it's really going to be exciting to see how that type of momentum builds into the next few games. And Vanderbilt soccer, everyone on West End is talking about it. A lot of people that were at the game, we had a few writers covering it, said it was an environment unlike any other. And to have that at a soccer game so early in September is just what's to come. And once November and December come around, don't be surprised if you see the Vanderbilt Commodores competing for an NCAA tournament uh, trophy. Yeah, to your point, the culture is certainly there. There was a great turnout for a Sunday game, and I think more and more people will be flocking to the stands as this team gets more and more exciting. Let's hit our final topic of the day, Andrew, and we got to talk about this Wake Forest game. This is the big test of the non-conference schedule, the game that you predicted they would lose, the game that I said would be tough. I'm not even sure. Where are you at with it after two weeks of the season? I want to first say it's, it's so nice of Las Vegas. Every week, Las Vegas decides the odds of how much a team will win or lose. Vanderbilt originally was supposed to lose by 12 and a half. Now it's 10 and a half. What makes those two points a change? Is it Wake Forest not, not beating Elon emphatically enough? Or is it Vanderbilt kind of having such a good second half against Alabama A&M? I think a big reason with that is kind of like I was saying earlier, Vanderbilt can play up or below to their competition. Star defensive end Darren Agu will be back. He has not played this season. That will be key in stopping Mitch Griffiths' offensive prowess. Griffiths replaces uh, Heisman Trophy candidate uh, Sam Hartman, and he will be the leader in their slow mesh offense, which is essentially a run pass option, but it's a slower development. They're the only offense in college football that does it. All of these things will be great experience for Vanderbilt. I think it's huge that Clark Lee and the Commodores 
played this offense last year, so they kind of know what coverages they should be expecting and which seams the, the offense will be going at. What I'm concerned about is the Vanderbilt secondary. When you're getting torn apart to an Alabama A&M or Hawaii, just imagine these really, really fast receivers in the ACC. Griffiths has been in this offense for four seasons. It's going to be very hard for the secondary and corners to be there. You just have to pray star safety Dericky Wright will be back from injury on Saturday. Yeah, and speaking of injuries, like you said, Darren Agu coming back is big. You also have Linus Zunk coming back in there. You've got guys coming back from injuries. You've got a few guys on the offensive line who are still questionable. So we don't know. We don't know if Junior Uzebu is going to be in there. We don't know if Layden Nelson is going to be in there. There are guys that could certainly help and contribute to this rotation if they were going to be in there. But to your point about the secondary, I mean, that has to be one of my biggest concerns as well. Jamal Banks last week tore up Elon. And I, I understand it's Elon, but we're working off information with Vanderbilt against, uh, against FCS opponents. We're working off and let's not thing. forget, Vanderbilt only beat Elon by uh, one possession last year. Maybe it was 10 points, but it came down right down to the wire. They're yeah. not a bad team. No, they're not. And it didn't come down. To, you might have said that Wake Forest should have beat them by more, but it didn't come down to the wire. The score was 37 to 17, and, and they had this game most of the time. But anyway, Jamal Banks, six catches, 108 yards. He had a score. His connection with Griffiths looks really good right now. Something to watch, though, with Wake Forest. Their run game was awful last week. They had 98 yards on 35 attempts. You know what that equates to? 2.8 yards a carry. So their air attack has been pretty high flying. So it's interesting that Vanderbilt's run defense has been playing a little bit better. Their pass defense still a little bit questionable, but it seems like Wake Forest is going to have to rely on the pass. So it's kind of going to be strength against weakness. So that doesn't, that doesn't bode too well for Vanderbilt in my mind. The other thing is on the offensive side. Because I love what I'm seeing from Will Shepard. I love what I'm seeing from Jaden McGowan. I need to see more from Quincy Skinner, who's been dealing with a hamstring injury, to be fair. Absolutely. And let's transition to a hot take segment about the game. I, I predict Will Shepard to have three touchdowns, which would make him what? having six touchdowns through three games. Or no, it would have him seven touchdowns through three games. He already has had two in the past two games. He is a force to be reckoned with. The touchdowns he's had would be touchdowns against SEC opponents. And why not have a bold take before such a big game? I think it's going to be really exciting to watch. And I can't wait for us next week to be talking about, hopefully, my hot take being right. And if not, you can make fun of me. Well, you know, if you're going to throw in a hot take, I have to throw in a hot take as well. Cedric Alexander. 1-5-0, 150 yards for Cedric Alexander. Is that rushing oh yards or all-purpose? Uh, all-purpose. I'm going rushing yards. Cedric okay. Alexander, Clark Lee is going to feed the beast. They're going to need the run game to be working for them. Take a little bit of that pressure off A.J. Swan, right? Find a way to work in the receivers. I'm looking at the rookie receivers, too. I got, like, London Humphreys. Um, but give me Cedric Alexander. 150 Cedric Alexander had 29 touchdowns senior year of high school. This guy is a force to be reckoned with, and I really hope both hot takes are right. So, before we go, do you have a score prediction? Are score we... prediction, Vanderbilt 35, Wake Forest 34. Wow! Gotta, gotta believe. Wow! I mean, right. if, if my hot take, if Will Shepard has three touchdowns. Right, but I could see, I could see Cedric Alexander having 150 yards on the ground and still possibly losing, I don't know. But if Will Shepard has three touchdowns, I agree. They're not losing this game. You know, uh, give me, give me, give me Vanderbilt forty, Wake Forest thirty-five. So we both predict shootouts, which I think is it's, a fair that's what it's gotta prediction. Be. That's what it's got to be and based on most of these defensive performances so far, right? And a win will be so, so momentous for this organization two weeks before conference play. Cannot wait to come back next week, and thank you all so much. <laughs>